تبسم 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 وخلي الهموم وخلي الغموم وخلي الضجاج ولا تبتئس من صروف الزمان ولا تشتكي من طعون البشر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن اهتدى بهديه واقتدى بسنته إلى يوم الدين وبعد فقد قال جل وعلا في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله يأمركم أن تؤدوا الأمانات إلى أهلها وإذا حكمتم بين الناس أن تحكموا بالعدل إن الله نعم ما يعظكم به إن الله كان سميعا بصيرا صدق الله العظيم Honorable scholars, respected brothers, elders, mothers and sisters, it is basic knowledge, if not common sense, that if a person intends traveling to an unknown destination, then he or she will enter the appropriate coordinates on the navigation device, follow the directions and hopefully arrive at the intended destination. While it would be naive, if not foolish, and probably tantamount to insanity, if a person chooses to blatantly deny the directions given to him, yet anticipate arriving at the intended destination. The Muslim Ummah globally finds itself in an appalling crisis. The reason is quite apparent from the theory shared with you. The Nabi of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave us a navigation device that never loses signal, that never loses reception. And that is the Quran and Sunnah. We were told to take a turn, we ignored it. We were told to go ahead, we ignored it. And hence we are in the state where we are. One scholar said, O oh, Ummah, you have fallen so low, there is no more place to fall. But as you know, often when you have taken a wrong turn, what does the device say to you? Take a U-turn when possible. Take a U-turn when possible. And that's the focus of my talk. How you and I, at this juncture, can take a U-turn in our life. And if we take that U-turn, hopefully it will have ripple effects in our surroundings and globally from a micro to a macro level. So I share with you an amazing incident recorded by Imam Bukhari rahimahullah in Tariq al-Saghir on page 29 on the strength of Zayd ibn Aslam who reports from his father that one day the great giant legend and luminary Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, was sitting with a group of Sahaba an era rich with great giants, people whose names were synonymous to, to, to oceans of knowledge. And he said to them, Taman, no. Each one of you express what is his innermost desire. Faqala ahaduhum, look at that era. When we say those were our glory days, they were not only our glory days in political context, they were not only our glory days in economic context, they were not only our glory days in terms of spirituality, Look at what was concealed in the heart of an average Muslim. What was contained in the bosom of a believer. Today, if you tap me and I have to whisper or spell out my inner desires, I'm afraid it is unsavory thoughts. It is illicit fantasies. It is illegitimate deals. Those are the kind of things may Allah protect and save one and all. But look at the richness of these people's thinking pattern. So Umar says, Tamanna, tell me, what do you wish for? أتمنى أن يكون ملء هذا البيت دراهم فأنفقها في سبيل الله. I wish this entire room was brimming with dirhams, with wealth and asset, and I owned it not so that I could use it, but so that I could benefit the cause of Islam, not for any personal or family or domestic reason, not a selfish motive, but a selfless endeavor. Umar was very impressed, but that wasn't the kind of answer he was wanting to hear. Good, brilliant, awesome. In its place. Anybody else has any other aspirations? I wish this entire room was brimming with chunks of gold and I owned it so that I could spend it, dispense it for the betterment, the advancement of Islam. Again, Sayyidina Umar impressed 
but not to the extent what he really wants to hear. He passes the microphone in, 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 in simple context to the third person and he says, what is your aspiration? And he says, Atamanna an yakuna mil al bayti jawhar. I wish this entire room was brimming with jewels, with rubies, with diamonds, with pearls. And I own this asset so that I could spend that wealth to better the, 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 the cause of Islam. So in a nutshell, there were three opinions. The common thread that binds the three were owning something valuable to benefit the cause of Islam. With a variation of expression from wealth to gold to diamonds. Umar radiallahu still implored them, can I hear more? Umar, that's about it. We've exhausted. We cannot run our imagination beyond this year. Somebody masters the courage and they say, Oh, Umar, would you whisper in our ears, what is your vision? What is your dream? What do you hope to see? He said, I wish I could clone a thousand Mu'adh ibn Jabal. And I wish I had reserves of Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah. And I wish I had abundance of Hudayfa ibn Yaman. Give me these three individuals in a multiple form. And leave the planet with its crisis. And give me these three people. And I will rescue the world from all its chaos. What's the aspiration? What was Umar screaming out to in these three people? Radiallahu anhum. Was it their name? Was it their proximity to the Master? وسلم? Surely in that regard they were not exclusive. The other noble companions enjoyed it just as much. But it was certain qualities for which they stood out, which are dwindling if not absent in the Ummah, which has resulted in the collapse and the decline and the degeneration of this Ummah. Then he said, wait, I'm not just saying something. Let me substantiate. Let me put flesh to the theory. Let me, let me deliver on what I'm saying. He gave 400 dinars. He said, go give this to Hudayfa ibn Yaman radiallahu anhu and say, this is a gift from the Amir al -Mu'mineen. So the messenger and the envoy takes the money. And as it comes to Hudayfa ibn Yaman and he receives this pleasant gift, subhanallah, he says, brother, Jazakallah for this, but you want to help me? I've got a list of all the people in the community that are needy. I want to assist them immediately. This was the amazing thing with the pious. I've got 10 things on my mind and 10 things in my archives that the day I get my bonus check, I need to upgrade my phone. I need to do this. I need to do that. But the pious were those who had the needs of the community that if Allah gives me a bonus, or sudden wealth or unexpected revenue that comes my way, I need to assist, I need to support, I need to alleviate, I need to respond. And that reminds me of the quotation in Madari Kut Tanzil, where Abu Zaid says, I was performing Hajj, and a youngster came to me and he nudged me and he said, Mazzuhdu fikum, Uncle, you look like a noble man, a sage of the age, you look like a wonderful human. What's the definition of piety by your, by your standards? So I said, Ida wajadna akalna wa ida faqadna sabarna. That when Allah favors us, we enjoy. And when Allah tests us, we persevere. So he didn't kind of take kindly to my definition. So I said, I see a scowl and a frown on your face, almost suggesting that you disapprove with my definition. He said, accurate. You're right. That's not what I believe is piety. So I said, then take the liberty and explain to me what is nobility and virtue. He said, إِذَا وَجَدْنَا أَثَرْنَا وَإِذَا فَقَدْنَا صَبَرْنَا when Allah gives us, then we pass it on to those that don't have. And when Allah tests us, we join those that never had. When Allah gives us, the Quran uses an amazing, a phenomenal, an amazing phrase. The pious are those who do not say, I have given you this wealth. But they say, Allah left your wealth in my custody. So Uwais al-Qarni, and I don't want to digress, my time is short and I'm really cutting it fine. Uwais Qarni, the great Tabi'i, when the sun would tip on the western horizon, the last piece of bread that he had in his possession that was surplus to his need, he used to give it in charity. 
And then he used to make that statement that gives me a shiver and a shudder in my body. Allahumma man mata ju'an fala tu'akhidhni bihi. Allah, anyone and everyone who dies today, whether on the horn of Africa, due to abject poverty, Allah, don't hold me liable. I gave my last piece of bread in charity. And whatever surplus cloth he had, before the sun would set, he would give it in charity. Allahumma man mata uriyanan. Allah, whoever died due to lack of shelter, clothing, or roof above his head, don't take away skarni to task on the day of Qiyamah. He owns nothing more than what clads his body. If you go in your closet, my brother, and I go in my bedroom, I will shed tears of blood. And perhaps it's time to introspect. What were my opening comments? Rerouting you. Take a U-turn when possible. It's about time we take a U-turn. So coming back, he sends this money to, same thing he sends to Mu'adh ibn Jabal, to Hudayfa ibn Yaman and Abu Ubaidah. And each one of them respectively do not hoard that wealth. They dispense of it immediately. And that's when Umar said, now are you convinced on my vision? Do you respect my ambition? And do you know why I was calling out to these people? In a nutshell, I want to communicate briefly three messages through the lives of these three personalities. And that's just a cursory glance. It's not an in-depth look into their lives and, and really analyzing the richness of their biography and the richness of their example and the nobility of their uh, of, 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 you know, the, the lineage of, uh, and the legacy they leave behind. So when we look into the life of Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah, his name is synonymous to honesty, loyalty, fidelity, and trustworthiness. إِنَّ لِكُلِّ أُمَّةٍ أَمِينًا وَأَمِينُ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ أَبُوْ عُبَيْدَةِ Every nation has a right to pride themselves with someone who stands out whose salient feature is honesty, loyalty, and fidelity. And if we've asked to showcase our representative, then the Master وسلم, said, surely Abu Ubaidah, it's going to be you. Where is loyalty in this ummah? How many amen today spend lavishly on their spouses, not out of a good heart, but only to appease the guilt of infidelity that they indulge in in the odd hours of the night. How many men who come home don't have the courage to look their wives in their eyes due to the disloyalty that happens behind the scenes. And there is this inner soul that's reproaching, that's chastising. She's the mom of my kids. She's been loyal. She's been amazing. But my evil and my vice, I have succumbed to it. And it's got a grip around me. And it's dominated me. And now to appease this guilt, in Arabic they say, Al-wafa'u shajaratun jami'u thimariha tayyiba. Loyalty is a tree that only bears good fruit. Loyalty is a tree that only bears good fruit. وَزِّوَاجٌ بِلَا وَفَاءٍ أَيَّامُهُ قَلِيلًا In a marriage devoid of loyalty, bereft of fidelity, only has but few weeks, if not days, to survive. So Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah, the Master sallallahu alayhi wa said, a time, will come, a time will come where honesty would become so absent, حَتَّى يُقَالْ أَنَّ فِي بَنِي فُلَانٍ رَجُلًا أَمِينًا It would be such a rarity, it would be so scarce that people would say in this country, on this continent, in this particular location, you must travel and go and meet this man. He's an honest man. People would traverse the planet to come and meet him. Brother, I've come to meet you. I believe you're honest. I believe you're an honest man. And furthermore, the Prophet ﷺ said, the flip side of the coin, while honesty would become so rare, Hatta yuqal, it would be said regarding people, ma aqalahu, wa ma adrafahu, wa ma ajladahu, wa ma fi qalbihi mithqalu dharratim min iman. It would be said regarding people who are immoral celebrities. You read up the private life, read up the social life carried by mainstream media, not in some corner article or some column. I've read it. And you would be appalled to see the fabric in their lives. You would be appalled to see their private life. 
Yet the Prophet وسلم, say people will laud them. People will sing their praises. It would be said phenomenal, amazing, mind boggling. <laughs> this is a superhuman. And there won't be a thread of faith in him or an iota of morality in him. There won't be an iota of morality in him. And our youth will idolize such people. And I don't have the time to digress and share with you captions of articles that I've personally read. Lee, meet the 11 greatest sinners in football history. That was once an article that caught my eye. And it was really, it's, it's unsavory and it's in bad taste to even divulge that. But it was carried by mainstream media. The point I'm saying is, we need to take a U-turn. What did Omar say through which he can rescue the world? I want to communicate the message. I don't want to give you 10 theories and leave you hanging in the air. Here's the message, my brother. Honesty, loyalty, fidelity. Be committed. Honor your word. So the Prophet وسلم, after the demise of his honorable spouse and noble consort Khadija radiallahu anha, then the proposal was taken to who? The proposal was taken to Aisha radiallahu anha by Khawla binti Hakim radiallahu anha. When she comes with the proposal, she said, Oh, the house of Abu Bakr, the greatest honor has knocked your door. The paragon of Allah's creation, Muhammad ibn Abdullah alayhi salatu min Allahi wa taslimat has proposed to your daughter. Can the words of any language potentially encapsulate the joy, the bliss, the jubilation, the excitement that would engulf a home where the prospective son-in-law is the greatest human that has ever put foot on this earth. But Zainab radiallahu the mother of Aisha, better known as Umm Ruman, she said, we are elated, we're ecstatic, we're overwhelmed. But the harsh reality is, Mut'im has made some whispers that his son Jubair is interested in my daughter Aisha. Before I get overexcited, we cannot backtrack or retract our commitment made with him. Allahu Akbar! Allahu Akbar! Can you imagine if I have a young ordinary man proposing to my daughter and then comes a high profile affluent, what do we say? Tough luck! Fly kites! Sorry my friend, you can try your luck elsewhere. But Muhammad Wasallam's example was unique. Abu Bakr radiallahu immediately goes to the house of Mut'im. He says, listen, I have received this ecstatic, overwhelming news. The greatest human is proposing for my daughter. I know you've made some whispers that you're interested. I need to know, is, are you formalizing this relation? Are we taking it to the next step? Or what's your thoughts? He says, no, 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 no. I've seen the advent of Islam and I'm afraid my daughter will forsake the creed of her ancestors. So please, you are free to go. Obviously, this was in the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But look at the honesty, look at the honesty of Abu Bakr. Ma akhlafa Abu Bakrin wa'dan qattu, he never violated his word. I share with you another incident, time is running out. Hudayfa ibn Yaman, Hudayfa and his father Yaman radiyallahu anhuma, they're leaving from Mecca. As they leave from Mecca, it's the month of Ramadan. The Prophet sallallahu is mobilizing for the campaign of Badr. Idh antum bil dunya wa hum bil udwatil quswa. وَالرَّكْبُ أَسْفَلَ مِنْكُمْ وَلَوْ تَوَاعَدْتُمْ لَخْتَلَفْتُمْ فِي الْمِيعَادِ Once when I was in Medina, I took my family to Badr. And I said, stand at the plains of Badr. Appreciate the richness of this location. The blessings that descended on this place. So yeah, Huzaifa and his father, Yaman, they leave Mecca Mukarrama. The narration is in Bidayah wa Nihaya. Ibn Kathir is captured this year. Abu Jahal apprehends him and intercepts him. He says, I'm not going to release you. Because you going to Medina to join the Muslims to become reinforcement against us. So it's foolish on my part to release my foe only to stab me in my back. So Huzaifa radiallahu anhu says, let's negotiate. He says, okay, negotiate. Release me, release me, and I promise you I would go to Medina. I will not join the Muslims against your army. Perfect. Abu Jahal, the arch enemy, the foe of Islam, releases the giant, the great Sahabi, the confidant of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Huzaifa radiallahu anhu and his dad, they come into Medina just when the Master sallallahu alayhi wa is exiting from Medina. Oh, Nabi of Allah, can we join you? Yes, please. We are short of numbers. We, we need people to come in. But I need to bounce something off you, O Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Go for it. I'm all yours. I'm listening to you. As I exited Mecca, Abu Jahl apprehended me. He wouldn't release me. And then I negotiated, giving him the assurity that I would not join you. But I only said that to appease him. So I want to join you. The Nabi of Allah said, no, 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 no. Hudayfa, as much as we are weak and feeble 
and we need you. Our word given to a Muslim or to a non-Muslim is something we never violate. Read the narration of Bidaya. The world is more thirsty for the truth and the correct values than those on, in the Horn of Africa for food and drinks. But you and I have tarnished the image, we've soiled the name, we've compromised the identity. Huzaifa ibn Yaman enjoys a thousand accolades. But if he doesn't have one feather in his cap, he's not a veteran of Badr. And why is he not a veteran of Badr? Because he casually made a commitment to an infidel. But Islamic value system compelled him to govern himself by the word uttered to Thomas or Peter, Yusuf or Qasim. We move on. The next Sahabi, time is short, so I'm just running you through. Who was the next person that Sayyidina Umar radiallahu spoke about? He spoke about Mu'ad ibn Jabal. He said, I need more Mu'ad on my side. What was in the life of Mu'ad? In a nutshell, his name was synonymous to knowledge. We've become complacent with our levels of ignorance. I often say there was a time used to say, he's so learned and he's more learned. Now there are levels of ignorance. He's more ignorant, he's less ignorant. Right? We've, we've lost the touch of knowledge. We've lost the grip of knowledge. We've lost the passion of knowledge. And what did the Prophet ﷺ said? Mu'adh would lead the scholars on the day of Qiyamah. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, Kunna nushabbihu mu'adhan bi Ibrahim. We used to refer to Sayyidina Mu'adh like one entire nation when it came to submission and compliance to the dictates of Sharia. And the Prophet ﷺ one day looked at him and he said, Mu'adh, how are you doing? He says, I'm in good spirits. He says, Explain, expound, elucidate. What do you mean by good spirits? What's the yardstick against which you define good spirits? He says, Asbahtu mu'minan haqqan ya Rasulallah. My condition is such, Ida amsaytu, when I see the evening, I don't think I would live to the morning, so I keep my deals clean and clear. When I see the morning, I doubt I would see the evening. When I take one foot step, I'm not sure if I will follow it up by the next one. And it's almost like I can see the dwellers of Jannah enjoying the bounties and the bliss and the, the amenities of paradise. And he وسلم, said, You've recognized the truth, just hold on to it. Aid ibn Abdullah anhu says, I entered into the masjid. It was the early era of Umar ibn Khattab. I seen this young man sitting in a noble gathering. My heart cries, and I've said it in many of my talks locally and abroad. How nice it would be. May Allah make that a reality that if I get up in the odd hours of night and I tap on the door and I see the light is on in my daughter's room or I see the light is on in my son's room and when I get there, I find one on the prayer mat or one reciting Quran or one crying in supplication to Allah. On the reverse, if I get in, there are earphones stuffed in one's ear. Another one is busy on the net perusing some illicit, unlawful, unsavory things. And it's just appalling. And you start, sit in wonder. I got up to relieve myself. And I had to contend with things that were more bitter and more challenging. But subhanAllah, he said, I walked into the masjid. It was a group of young youth that were converged and congregated. And in the dead center was this person. الوجه, radiant, sweet in his tone. Absolute confidence. Whenever they would ask him anything, he would swiftly answer. My curiosity was piercing through the roof. When the gathering terminated and the people dispersed, I nudged the man next to me. I said, who's this beautiful young man? He said, he's the gentleman Mu'adh ibn Jabal. He's Mu'adh ibn Jabal. What's the message from Mu'adh? I told you the first message from Abu Ubaidah. Loyalty, faithfulness, honesty. From, Abu, from, from Sayyidina Mu'adh ibn Jabal, he said, Ta'allamu ma shi'tum, falay yanfa'akum ul'ilm hatta ta'malu. Acquire knowledge as much as you want. You will not receive any benefit from that until you don't translate that into action. Imam Ghazali said, وَعْلَمْ أَنَّ عِلْمًا لَا يُبَعِّدُكَ عَنِ الْمَعْصِيَةِ الْيَوْمِ كَيْفَ يُبَعِّدُكَ عَنِ النَّارِ غَدًا Remember the knowledge that cannot become an obstacle, a hurdle and an impediment to vice in this world. You are dreaming for that knowledge to rescue you from the chastisement on the day of Qiyamah. If it cannot buy you from vice here, how is it going to buy you, insulate you, inoculate you, fortify you from, from the chastisement and the punishment of Akhirah? And the third Sahabi to whom he was calling out, and he said, I wish we need more. And really I say, Umar, you had the original, we don't even have the generic. 
Omar, you had them in one form. You wanted to clone them. We don't even have them in a generic form. Oh my Allah, where are we? Where has the Ummah lost their values and, and, and their direction? It was Hudayfa ibn Yaman. Who was Hudayfa ibn Yaman? كان الناس يسألون رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم عن الخير وكنت أسأله عن الشر بخافة إن يدركني. He said everybody would come to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and say, post your demise, what prosperity will come our way? Post your demise, what goodness will come our way? And I used to come on a very reverse psychology. I used to say after your demise, what challenges will grab us? What trials will plague us? What fitness will paralyze us? And people used to say, but, but be positive, be optimistic. Why are you being so negative? And I used to say, if I'm not aware of the trials, how will I take the relevant inoculations against those trials? How will I inject myself? How will I fortify myself? So he was a man that was hands-on. We are living in a time under the guise of good, under the pretext of good, in the garb of good. People are coming to put wool over our eyes. People are coming to rob us of our faith. People are coming to deceive us of our Iman. We are worried about the virus that's out in the atmosphere and we're taking immune boosters. We worried about the virus that hit in the net and hit in my computer. It's about time we take safety measures to protect and preserve and enhance and, and insulate our Iman and our faith. And what did Hudayfa ibn Yaman say? Laysa alladheena yatrukoon ad-dunya. Those people, Laysa khiyarukum alladheena yatrukoon ad-dunya lil-akhira. Wala alladheena yatrukoon al-akhira lil-dunya. Walakinna alladheena yaakhudhoon min hathihi wa hathihi. That's the balance. That's the purity. That's the, that's the universal nature of Islam. And we conclude on these words. He said, Islam does not advocate that you must abandon this world. Nor does Islam suggest that you must abandon the year after. But strike the fine balance. Strike the fine balance. وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصْرِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا وَأَحْسِنْ كَمَا أَحْسَنَ اللَّهُ إِلَيْكَ وَلَا تَبْغِ الْفَسَادَ فِي الْأَرْضِ Do not omit your share from this world. Acquire it through legitimate sources in a manner that brings you close to the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gives us the ability to take that U-turn. Remember my brother, the good news is, even if you took the U-turn and you didn't get to your goal, in English they say, the tragedy is not in, in not achieving your goal. The tragedy is when you have no goal. The tragedy is not that I didn't achieve my goal. The tragedy is I have no goal. If you've taken the U-turn, right, by the prophetic narrations, and you got onto the correct highway, and if abruptly the angel of death meets you, but you were facing the correct direction, your abode would be connected to your destination and not your location. فَكَانَ أَقْرَبْ إِلَى الْقَرْيَةِ الصَّالِحَةِ بِشِبْرٍ The famous hadith where the man committed and perpetrated a hundred murders. He took the U-turn and just when he took the U-turn, the angel of death came and removed his soul. And then there was a big argument, but then it was finally concluded positively simply because the direction was right. I leave you with a thought-provoking quote and I do this often in my talks. The, someone said it very beautifully in the English language. They said, A long life might not be good enough, but a good life is long enough. وَصَلِّ اللَّهُمَّ وَسَلِّمْ عَلَى نَبِيْنَا مُحَمَّدٍ